And then finally, you get it that you say, but my creator, I come to you with uh, this knowledge in my life. Most of it is what, how not to be and what not to do. But I have all this knowledge. And he says, you got it. You're coming to me with the knowledge of your life. And that's beautiful and that's very valuable. And then at that moment, you're, you're part of everything. Wow. Very powerful. Wow. And you come to them with the knowledge of your life, very powerful. And then it's in the morning, the elder opens the door and says, uh, uh, you have to come back, but you don't want to come back. Say, why should I come back? I mean, why should I be a stupid human being? I don't want to come back. I don't want to confine uh, my spirit in that body because I'm I'm one with everything. Yeah. Why would I limit myself to be a human being? Someone's opinion may contradict yours. Where's my friend Alan? It's all about your perspective. Who are we and what is the nature of this reality? Hey everyone, welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. We're on site at the American Anthropological Association's annual meeting for our second partnership with them. We are now sitting down with Douglas Cardinal. Hi, Douglas. Okay. Thanks for coming nice on the program. It's nice Appreciate to be it. here. Wonderful to be in Vancouver. Yeah, you had such a profound keynote last night where we were immersed in your world-renowned architectural experience, design blending together spirituality and nature into your projects that you've worked on. And I've been talking to you quite a bit since last night, and I'm really grateful that you came on the program. I want to talk to you about this most first-principled question. Are we really all one? Yes. We're, uh, my experience, which the elders put me through, um, in order to start reconnecting myself uh, to my mind, body, and spirit. Uh, my experience is working with them that we're all one, we're all interconnected to all of life and uh, all of life around us and, and throughout the universe. We're connected to the planet, the very core of this planet. We're connected to each other, and connected to every animal, bird, fish, plant, and everything else. And <clears throat> our elders don't teach us that because then it comes to our heads. The elders have to actually have us feel that. So yes. in their ceremonies, in the vision quests, um, you actually go through a life and death experience. You see, the only way you're going to learn that you're part of all of creation is that you have to go to the other side and back. And in that journey, you will see how connected you are to all life. And what is this other side that you speak the of? The other in side this vision is quest after death. Is post death, okay. Yeah. So near death experiences. What are the vision quests that the elders send you on? Well, to feel the oneness. To feel the oneness, well, um, uh, you're asked to go, I mean, you, because you're searching for this answer. You're, you're feeling entirely disconnected. With me, um, the church and state, through my mind, disconnected me from my, uh, from my body and my spirit and from everything around me. It's such a, a way that I would uh, totally uh, lose feelings in my hands and feet. And my mind 
uh, would be disconnected from my body and I would, uh, I would then uh, gradually uh, lose uh, feelings in my body and until I would go unconscious. And, and that created a tremendous stress on my, my body, my internal organs, and particularly my kidneys, because they would stop functioning. And then I was in real trouble. So the elders, they came and took me out of the hospital and said, we need you. Oh, we don't have time for this. You better come and be with us and we'll, we'll uh, make you whole again. So, <clears throat> and of course, uh, I had a thirst for living and so I said, uh, if you can help me with this because nothing seems to help me. I mean, I'm totally, uh, uh, and the doctors, when I went to University of Texas, felt that uh, I had the same illness that astronauts get when they get out in space, they get totally disconnected because they're out in space and there's no connection to the planet. And, uh, and they go through this process of, of where they feel this tremendous anxiety where uh, their mind and body seem disconnected and and you go through tremendous vertigo and you you uh, lose feeling of your whole body and and you go unconscious and so the challenge is uh, how to get you back on your feet again and it, and it, with me it was I, when I started getting these things, the only thing I could do would be run out into the forest and and tear all uh, civilization away from me and sit under a tree. Yes. So that I could start connecting to to Earth. Yes. Uh, but uh, the more I got into our urban environment and working in our urban environment and, and that uh, that whole way of life which is sort of disconnecting oneself totally from nature and from each other uh, I found it that I would continually to get these stress attacks to a point where my kidneys stopped functioning and then I was in real trouble and so the elders took me out of the hospital and said, uh, we need you, we don't have time for this. And so yeah. you're going to come out with us. And they, they, uh, their ceremonies were against the law at that time. So they left their communities and went to the mountains and created a camp. Uh, the chief, Robert Smallboy, created a camp where all the elders could come and practice their traditions and their ceremonies. <coughs> so they took me up to the mountains and then they, they uh, uh, brought me back. But I had to learn uh, how to connect myself yeah. to myself because yes. I was totally disconnected. This seems like absolutely the most first principled thing about life is that we come from the one and that we no matter what path you take back up this mountain to recommune with the one the drop or this wave must rejoin the ocean it must have the experience of rejoining the ocean to truly understand the nature of this reality at its most yeah. first principled level. And then that, the fact that there's so many people, humans, that have not done that process of recommuning with this infinite one, that then that is the most upstream root issue that all of our world faces. We face the feelings of separation, of disconnectedness. Yes. 
and uh, uh, I uh, I sensed that more um, after that experience I've had by connecting myself with the one and uh, because I particularly was against every religion and every spiritual uh, um, thing after I was came out of the residential school I was totally turned against uh, uh, anything that had to do with religion or spirituality and that was being really disconnected but uh, so the process that the elders had and it and it was passed down for thousands of years it was a, a really a, a process of where at first we had to go through a sweat lodge it's a purification rite and in that sweat lodge you um, you bring in the rocks red hot rocks and you bring in the water and you go back to the origins of the planet where it's the water on the rocks that brought life uh, and then you relive that experience where you go in there and it is unbelievably scalding hot yeah. and uh, that's because uh, you have to surrender you have to get off your arrogance and the only way you can uh, the elder will keep pouring the water in there until until you reach out and pray to something that's beyond yourself you reach out to the creator of us all and there are special songs that are sung that uh, help you uh, go on that spiritual journey of reaching out beyond yourself and asking the creator to come and help you through the experience because your mind will stop you will tell you are you crazy are you nuts you know yeah. what are you doing in this place you know yeah. you're going to get hurt and you're going to burn and you're going to you might even die in here I mean and so it scares the shit out of you so you can't listen to your mind you got to listen to the songs yeah. and if your mind is giving you a rough time the elder may distract your mind like this with a rattle to distract your mind because the mm. mind will be on a one-way track it is concerned about your preservation yeah and so it's scaring the shit out of you yeah to to stop this they it, use a rattle to interfere with the monkey mind racing away yeah that's, that's what the, how the rattle is used that's so interesting and it brings you back to the oneness yeah, because you it distracts the mind, yeah. and all of a sudden, you know your your mind uh, is uh, is just another noise that you're dealing with. Yeah. The rattles are more important in there because if you're if you uh, you might be distracted enough where he'll bang your head with a rattle, so that you you uh, don't have your mind. See, it's your mind that that is the problem child here it's a mind that disconnected you it's your own ego yeah. yes yes and feeling that of your own self-importance your own ego and I've got to be in charge and in there yeah. it's pitch black and there's no way out uh, the roots go right down the willows go right down and you can't get out and so you make a commitment to go in and the door is not open when you yell open the door it's too hot uh, sorry you made that commitment to be in here the door isn't open until the elder says the door is open wow yeah and so you're trapped in there what yeah. are you going to do i mean what if you're in a car accident you're trapped in a burning car what are you going to do <laughs> Jeez. you have to surrender Jeez. so 
Wow. You, you will surrender. Um, Would you say sweat lodges are that close to near-death experiences? Well, the elder that decided that he was going to make me whole, yes. Oh my God. It's a purification rite. Wow. And, and because you're out of balance. And if, uh, and he can see the aura of your life force. And there are holes in your aura for trauma of, that you've caused yourself that imbalances your body. So those are your uh, things that you're doing to your body. It's a, also a healing lodge. Yes. Because believes that all that the body is designed to totally defend itself. It has all sorts of ways of, you know, uh, of healing itself because it keeps regenerating itself, like, uh, like the eye, uh, I can't remember how many months it takes for the eye to totally replace every cell, every molecule in your eye is being replaced. So your body is in a continual state of dying and rebirth, yeah, every yeah. cell yes. in your body. And after, I can't remember how many years it is, I think maybe seven years. I think so too. Every cell in your body is replaced. Every molecule yeah. in your body is replaced. So you're continually uh, changing and, yeah. and living and dying all the time, every cell. And if you cause some traumas in your experience, it can affect the cells in your body to such a point where when it regenerates, it has flaws in it. And that's what creates uh, a lot of illnesses because most of uh, the, our illnesses, as far as our elders are concerned, are psychosomatic. Yeah. They're created by our way of thinking. Yeah. And our whole immune system can heal yes, if we yes, yes. balance ourselves. So in the lodge, if you see the person's aura, there are dark spots where, yeah, yeah, yeah. where um, the mind has interfered yes. with the, uh, with the, the wholeness, energy field. With the wholeness, the, with the wholeness. And you can, in the aura, you can see those dark spots of where this this psychosomatic. Where the mind is interfering. Yeah, the mind's interfering. So the elder will take the eagle's way and go and right to that spot. And it's just like a spear going through you. Go, the eagle wing yeah. to the dark spot in the aura. Yeah. And that is it's, a, oh, it's, immediate. It's, uh, it's like the mind won't let go of that rage, that, that whatever incident has caused you, whether it's pain, somebody has hurt you, or so you have deep rage. Yes. And that deep rage is separating you from, yes. from that spirit. Yes. And so you go through this very difficult sweat lodge, but it's not just a healing lodge, it's to prepare you for your fast. For the fast. Yeah. And uh, how long's the fast? The fast is five days yes. without water or food. Yes. Yeah, dry fast, yeah. Yeah. Five days and four nights yep. without water or food. Yep. And uh, Wow. And this is the re so this is the the, the experience that the, the they take you on, the elders take you on, so yeah. that you can really feel as close this communion with the one. Yeah. It's a near death experience for you. Sweat lodge. It's the fast. To, to the, uh, fast. the sweat lodge and the fast. Yeah, interesting. And uh, <laughs> what age do they take the you? Well, uh, it's when any whenever anybody feels that they want, they have the courage to go on it because it's uh, one hell of a commitment. Does it happen as young as like 10 years old or as late as no. like 70 years old? No, Does it's uh, probably when you start dealing with, as a young adult, dealing with life in general. 15-ish, 20-ish, 25? Well, most of the guys in there were, of course, 
our, our teachings were separated from us, but I see young men doing it, you know, um, maybe 20. And do women go through a ritual like this as well? Yes. Yeah, a ceremony. Okay. The women can deal with it better <laughs> because they know how to deal uh, with uh, pain because they give childbirth. Yeah. They're more connected. Yeah. Because they're connected. They're reminded every month yes. in the lunar cycle that they're connected to the moon and to the earth. Yes. yes. And us guys have nothing to remind us. Like that, yeah. So that's why uh, we need the sweat lodge. Frankly, <laughs> I do a sweat lodge every week and have done it for 50 years. Every week for 50 years now. Yeah. 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 Wow. And th that's so interesting that you bring up how um, women have a, a part of their reproductive um, process that actually reminds them about their interconnectedness to the one uh, and how it's tied to the moon and how us men um, need a, s a sweat lodge to remind us about um, the one. We need a dry fast. We need these other processes that tie us to the one. Yeah. Um, this, I want to ask this question as well, that for, from the elders to the rest of the world, it seems to be the most common theme around indigenous talking to this younger brother that is in these metropolises that is going and, and tinkering and creating and exploring, but also in many ways causing destructive harm, that to remember the processes of the deep interconnection to nature and to each other and to the one. That seems to be the most common message from elders and that they're, what are the best things for the younger brother to do? And you gave us this example of, you know, the sweat lodges, the dry fasts, just going into the middle of the trees and just sitting and connecting. What are the best processes for the younger brother in the metropolis to do? Well, um, what I've seen is uh, um, you when you're when you're so disconnected and you have such trouble with your mind you self-medicate with drugs and alcohol yeah. and and I found uh, and I've helped uh, uh, the elders put together uh, initiatives like the Nietzsche Foundation that uses the traditional elders to help the young uh, urbanites to get away from drugs and alcohol by following the traditional ways. Because once you follow them, you don't have time for drugs and alcohol. Uh, in fact, uh, you realize that uh, in harming yourself, you're, you're uh, going against all of creation. And you have to learn how to honor yourself. Yes. Because particularly if you go on the long fast, because that experience is indescribably, well, I could describe it because um, from, from my perspective, um, uh, to go on a long fast. Um, and there are different ways. Uh, my elder um, uh, and some of the elders uh, have you go on the fast. The sequence is different. Um, a lot of the elders have a feast and then a, no, a sweat lodge and then a feast and they go for five days without water or food. Yeah. Uh, my elder, and who, who uh, had these ceremonies and, and uh, had us go on a feast, and then the sweat lodge, and then go and fast for yeah. five days. And after his sweat lodge, uh, experience. The sweat lodge experience is usually four rounds 
and the doors open each round and uh, you just feel like you're going to pass out or pass away yeah. and then he opens the door. Yeah. Ah, thank you. <laughs> and so there are yeah. four rounds like that. So, the cl so you're getting to that feeling of passing out, the near death, and then the door opens and then you're, the relief comes and then again the same process. Just like yeah. the fast is the five days, you yeah. feel towards the end like, oh, I need the water, I need the food, but you're overcoming the monkey mind that's constantly trying to yeah. rush you to those specific things. Yeah, except my elder, the way he would do the fast would be a little different. You'd have your feast, and then you'd go into the sweat lodge, and then you had to do all four rounds, and he would not open the door. Yeah, yeah no door, no, no door, door opening. Like, yeah. It was like, <laughs> how can I not surrender more than I have? You'd be yeah. just like a lump when you go through, and you'd be totally dehydrated. Ooh, yeah. You feel like you could spit dust because <laughs> your body is just total. Uh, there's no, it just seems there's no water in your body anymore. You've totally sweated it all out. And you really want a drink of water. And then you'd say, then you go out and fast. Yeah. Without water. Without water, yeah. For five days. Yeah. Douglas, what do you think is... <clears throat> but you'd go through on that fast. He would guide you through. Now you would be sitting out in a nature, a spot that he's chosen, that's a power point that he chose for you for that fast. And, and it would be made out of willows. And you had to, uh, the only way you could survive would be at par with a blade of grass. Like you had to not be any more important yeah. than that blade of grass. Wow. They would pick a location for yeah. you, and you would stay in that location? You'd stay in that lodge, and each willow, uh, you had to make the lodge before you go into the feast. For, but for five days, though, would you stay in yes. the same location? Yes. And you, could, you had to feel that you were the same importance as the blade of grass. Yeah, and the willows that you cut for the lodge, it's a dome just a dome that you can just sit up in and you're holding a sacred pipe and you sit up in there and it's open to the west the setting sun yeah and uh and you can um you you uh when you go in there uh, each willow i has to be that you put together, you you have to go to the willow tree, the spirit of that willow, and you have to say to the willow, I'm going to take your life, uh, and your life is important, but I want you, I'm going to take your life because I want to learn about the spirit of us all, mm. and I'll use your life in that way so that I will always respect the willows and the willow spirit. And I'll give you an offering before I take your life. Interesting. So there's a ceremonial offering that's given to the willow. Yeah. Then you take the spirit because you want to become one with it. Yes. And then you and you say, I want to become at one with the spirit of all life including yes. your spirit. Yes. And I will, I will honor you and use you in a good way. And so you, you, These you take the act, so acts important. like this, and you are very deliberate because you swiftly take the life of the willow. Um, and so you make sure you're really accurate four times and then you go whack. You take that willow and you realize that you've taken the life of another creature and that's what we do. We, all of the 
reason we survive is by taking the life of other creatures. So they're all, all of life around us are our life givers. Yeah. So even our food, we've taken life from a plant or, yes. the, or an animal yes. for yes. our food. Yes. Which all comes from the sun. Yeah. To uh, fuel the energy of that plant that we then eat. Yeah. But that plant is a life giver and, and requires the same respect they're part of us. Yeah. And we can't. Yes. Um, so we have to make sure that we do things in a loving and caring way, as our elders say. Yes. Because we have to care for that plant. They're, they're sacrificing their life for us. Yes, yes. So we have to honor that. And so, and then when we make the lodge, we when we um, put the lodge into the earth, we use red ochre on the bottom of the sharpened willow to remind us that we are piercing our mother, the earth. And our mother, the earth, is also uh, part of the spirit. It's a spirit itself. It is a life force itself. And our mother, the earth, is alive. Yes. And is a powerful spirit itself. So we humble ourselves by saying uh, to our mother, we are always causing you such pain. And we're causing you pain to build this lodge. And we have to remember that we have to honor and respect our mother. Yes. And yes. That, uh, These rituals are so important and well they the they're important because we are always in control and we're always disregarding um, our our environment around us the food we eat we just take it for granted yeah and there the elder says you cannot take these things for granted yeah, because yeah. if you you will you won't be able to commune with the spirit if you take these things for granted. Every breath of air, every bite of food, every interaction with yeah. nature at, and, and all other humans, nothing is for granted. Everything is sacred. And to yeah. see the divinity in that process yeah. and to have these rituals that help highlight the divinity in all of those processes. And you have to follow those uh, ways. If you do not he will say, you're not ready to do this fast. Yeah. You haven't prepared your mind for this. You still are an arrogant creature. Yeah. And, uh, wow. And so you have to really prepare yourself for a year um, to make sure you do this in the right way. If you're going to learn anything. And then... It, in, in which um, uh, indigenous do this, the sweat lodge, the dry fast, which indigenous? All Anishinaabe peoples. All Anishinaabe. Yeah, I'm talking about an Anishinaabe ritual. An Anishinaabe. The Haudenosaunee people have the same, very similar rituals, but they do things a little different. They, they turn their lodges to another direction. Interesting. And we always go into our lodge uh, clockwise. Yes. And the Haudenosaunee go anti-clockwise. Yeah. They just have different, each, each elder has a different way of doing things that were passed down to him. But our, he learns it by going through these ceremonies and, and he, he gets the ceremonies from the creator of us all. So yes, w what on the he gets the mm -hmm. pipe, the sacred pipe, or or the ceremony of, of us all. Like we have to say, I wanted to fast for the sacred pipe. So I asked the elder. 
he would, because I knew that that was, when I held on to the sacred pipe, I felt a connection in it. My vertigo went away. And so I thought, okay, I'll, I'll pass for the sacred pipe, and then that would solve my problems. So, so that I was holding the sacred pipe in the lodge to go through this whole ceremony, this, this vision quest with the elder. Yes. This is uh, comparing these styles of vision quests and experiences that immerse us into the wisdom of the interconnectedness of the one versus the serious levels of disconnection that are existing in the metropolises. There needs to be a global transition in terms of an evolution of consciousness towards indigeneity uh, in order for us to actually be able to figure out how to maximize prosperity going forward. And it seems as though this it, it, happening from both a, you give all these, exp, all these rituals, well these rituals to not only happen from a grassroots level of people, but also to go to the places like the biggest governments in the world, the biggest corporations in the world, and just you know, grabbing the top executives and, and public officials, and just, you, they have to do these rituals. That way they actually, they experience the ego death, they experience the interconnectedness with the one. All of their f decisions downstream become oriented towards the unity, the oneness, and not towards their own self-dealing, egotistical habits. Yeah, that um, um, that is uh, why uh, we uh, used it, went through these ceremonies because we had to get off it in terms of our self-importance yeah. in order to be able to work with nature, be a part of nature, and to, and to support each other and govern each other properly with loving and caring. Uh, these rituals are very important and were the foundation of our culture. See, because uh, hunter-gatherers need to have a special relationship with the environment. Their lives depend on it. Yes. As soon as you uh, become a member of the uh, agrarian culture and start manipulating the earth like agrarian cultures, then uh, you know you don't you know and and not rely on nature for for your livelihood and your life, then you lose all of that. Uh, yeah, many of the leaders we talked to talk about that moment of transition from immediate return hunter gathering to the agrarian society. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, the Haudenosaunee are agrarian, and uh, and they have retained their uh, rituals, uh, and so. Um, Interesting. But Haudenosaunee are agrarian. Yeah, they they grow corn, squash, beans. Yeah, you can still be very connected and grow food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Haudenosaunee were that way. The yeah. Mohawks. Yeah. And uh, but they were more warlike because they had to defend their crops. And uh, whereas in even defending our territories, um, it was not right to kill another human being, our warriors. Yeah. You, you actually taught us about this last night when we were talking. You said that wolves even if they come to the to dominate another wolf at the neck, 
they won't kill another of their own species. And that you said that another example of a similar um, trait is that when two tribes will then have a member of one of the tribes go and marry a member of the other tribe and procreate with them, marry, but just uh, procreate with them, Therefore, then, if there is conflict between those tribes, they would not then kill one of the descendants of their own lineage, those children. And so over time, then, it is as though then it does become that oneness more so. I love these things that you were passing along to us last yeah, night. Yeah, the, the, uh, the communities encouraged their... Um, young women to uh, to marry a, a member of the their enemy wow uh, yeah because they were they were another human being but so that they would be part of the family and uh, wow and, and so this is why U.S.-Chinese relations right now are very important. Marry U.S. people, marry Chinese people, Chinese people marry U.S. people so that we can make sure that the, uh, the geopolitical climate stays lovely and harmonious. Uh, between that's the why we, uh, all the Anishinaabe people, lived in harmony with each other. Although we had some rough skirmishes, but it was not the creator's way to to kill each other yeah that is a, a crime against the uh, absolutely the creator to do that absolutely yeah. Douglas I, I need to ask you this question um, what wh what is the point of creation making this why did creation make this um, we were growing and evolving, and uh, and in the long fast, what I have discovered, there is a point where um, you learn. At first, you're going through a lot of pain. You're thirsty and whatever. So the elders said, "You're going to have to." be able to uh, communicate with all of life around you. And you start realizing that you don't even belong in this damn earth, the way your mind is operating. You're bitten by mosquitoes and you're bitten by ants and, you're, and it's uncomfortable and you're sitting on the grass and it scratches you and like, what am I doing here? I, I don't even belong here, you know? And you start realizing that you you and, and you have to, in a sense, start communicating with all of these uh, creatures around you. So yes. you start talking to the the grass, and start talking to the trees. Yes. You start communicating, and and then you and then you're saying, um, give me, give me this part of the life force that you have, can you give me some of your life force so that I can survive this mm. experience? And then you ask the grass, can you help me through this? Yes. Put your hand on the grass and the grass, all of a sudden you feel life coming into your hand from your grass, you can feel it yeah. coming in. You say, oh, thank you, my grass. Or you walk over the tree and against the tree and say, "Please give me some of your energy, so that I can survive this day." And then you feel energy. You say to the clouds, "Please give me the spirit of the water, so that I can quench my thirst." And then you find that all of these spiritual energies start helping you. And you, uh, you feel that you're being fed by energy. 
by all the creatures around you. They're all supporting you yes. to such an extent that you feel that your total spirit, that you could walk right through a tree, that you're not physical anymore. And you feel uh, that you're just total spirit and that all the spirits around you are feeding you. So you surrender and you become humble and you ask for the life force from yeah. the other plants, animals around yeah, you. You, you. You know that they're, at this moment, they're more important than you because you're, you're... Uh, Four days into the dry fast. Yeah, and you're, you're uh, but then what happens is you, the elder says, you know, uh, your mind is, is really against uh, what you're doing and giving you a hard time. And you, what are you doing talking to the plant or the grass? What are you doing talking to the ants and, and the butterflies and the squirrels and the yeah. whatever? You're out of your mind, you know? And so the mind is giving you a rough time. Yeah. But then after you gain all this energy and you feel, I'm so powerful that I can fly. Like, I don't even have to be in this body. I'm all, I'm total energy. Wow. And I'm, I'm, I'm this powerful energy. I don't need this fast. Yeah. The other said, you watch out. The mind is going to twist you around, try to trick oh, you. Oh, interesting. And get you off this fast yeah. and off your commitment. Mm -hmm. Don't, this time at the fourth day, don't listen to your mind. Interesting. You're, mind was giving you a rough time before and I was trying to sweet talk sweet you, talk you. <laughs> out of out of this commitment because so the powerful. mind is so yeah. powerful and so tricky yeah, yeah. You and it's not your out. mind yeah. is not your friend the ego is not the amigo yeah, yeah. it's not your friend it's going to keep you from the power of the spirit around you so then uh, you you feel all powerful all filled with spirit and then uh, it's the last night is the hardest because when you see the sun goes down, all the uh, all of the life seems to go down with the sun. Yeah, and it's like the trees here that gave you energy. The energy goes back to the trees, goes back to the grass, goes back to everything. And then all of a sudden you feel that you can't even have the energy to blink your eyes. You just, wow. just your body has no more energy. And then, uh, uh, wow. and then you, you feel just your light around you. And then there's a big light that comes around you and totally surrounds you and pulls you out of your body and you're looking down at your body as a shell and it's absolutely terrifying you say oh my god i'm gonna die i'm i'm not gonna i'm gonna leave my body and i don't want to you know you know and so um so then this spirit this being is overwhelming it just takes you and you don't have control of it you think this is an illusion my mind is doing crazy things on me I mean, and then you say, I'm, I don't believe in what's happening. And then he goes, takes you out of the body again. Then finally you, you realize that the spirit is taking your life force out of your body. And this is a powerful force that, that you can't control. So then you uh, uh, start uh, trying to bargain with it, you're trying to do anything. Like, I don't want to die, I mean, you know, don't take me and all that. Yeah. And the more you fight it, the more it takes you. And you go, no, 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 I don't want to die, you know. Yeah. I don't want to go. And finally, uh, Interesting. The more it this takes being you. says, you arrogant creature, you don't have control over your life and death. Wow. You're such an arrogant creature, you know. As if you have control. As if you have control. Yeah. yeah. And 
and then see, do you have control? And then you're, you're taken out of your body and you look back and you go, oh my and then you God. come and you have to totally surrender to it. You go, finally you think of all the things you see. Uh, my creator, let thy will be done. What do you mean, let thy will be done, you arrogant creature? As if you have a choice. You don't have a choice. Who do you think you are, you arrogant creature? And then finally, uh, you, you just have to um, get off it and totally surrender and, and not argue with it, you know. And it's just, um, so you, so then uh, as you come, as you come closer and the light becomes brighter, um, all of a sudden you feel like uh, terrible because you're not worthy. That being is so loving and caring in contrast to the way you've lived that you, uh, you feel you're not worthy to be able to even touch that loving and caring. It's so caring for you. And, and, and you start judging yourself. Your life stops. Time stops and your whole life rolls back. And you see everything that you've done in your life. Wow. That is, uh, that is wrong. How you've hurt people, how you've hurt others, how you haven't honored your mother and your father. And wow. How you haven't, what you've done to your, all the mistakes you've made in your life is piled right up in you. Wow. And you have to go through each one and you just, it's so painful, you just feel like you're being torn apart. It is the most painful experience of all as you, as you go through an analysis of your life. All the shitty things you've done in your life, the thoughtless things you've done in your life, everything else, you go through that time stops and you go through your whole life. And, uh, and you, and the closer you come to the spirit, the more pain you feel for being so stupid and so hurtful and, and not a good person. And you just go through a terrible thing of seeing how you've hurt everybody and you just feel that you're just a terrible, creature, you know, and you're not worthy to, to be part of the creation. You're not worthy at all. Oh and finally, the, the, uh, this force says, stop it. Stop it. Stop it, you arrogant creature. Who do you think you are? As if you had that knowledge, like what you know now about that. Would you have done that, what you know now? No. See, you see, you're not a, a bad, benevolent creature at all. Probably a stupid one. You haven't evolved. Do you think you're a god? Do you think you can judge yourself? What are you doing? Get off it. You can't judge yourself. You didn't know any better. Mm. That's why you did that. Mm. If you know now, going back, what if you handled that differently? Yes, I would have done this and this. Of course you would have done that and that. Mm -hmm. You see, because that's not your nature. Yeah. You know, um, you can't judge yourself because you're not evolved yet. Mm. You're not evolved to that extent of knowing. Yeah. Wow. What you're doing was wrong. You were heartless. You were selfish. Yes, you were all about yourself. And you thought you were more important than other people in making this decision or that decision. So you go through your whole life like that. And, and that powerful being guides you through because he's loving and caring and trying to get you to go off it. 
and have you see that. And then finally, you get it that you say, but my creator, I come to you with uh, this knowledge in my life. Most of it is what, how not to be and what not to do. But I have all this knowledge. And he says, you got it. You're coming to me with the knowledge of your life. And that's beautiful and that's very valuable. And then at that moment, you're, you're part of everything. Wow. Very powerful. Wow. And you come to them with the knowledge of your life, very powerful. And then it's in the morning, the elder opens the door and says, um, uh, you have to come back, but you don't want to come back. <laughs> say, why should I come back? I mean, why should I be a stupid human being? I don't want to come back. I don't want to confine uh, my spirit in that body because I'm, I'm one with everything. Yeah. Why would I limit myself to be a human being? And uh, the elder then comes in with a sweet grass and he has a very hard time to bring you back because you don't want to come back. <laughs> he says, Life is so beautiful. You got to see the sunrise this morning. There's, there's a dew on the grass and the sunlight is sparkling on the grass and it is magnificent. Mm -hmm. He says, you've got to see how beautiful it is on this planet. Yes. How yes. amazing, beautiful. It is. And he keeps talking to, yeah. to us about how beautiful life was. And yeah. Beautiful it is. How gorgeous life is and how important it is. That's him pitching you to come back, selling you to come back. Yeah, and you're trying to, and you don't want to come back. <laughs> and finally, he, he keeps telling you, beautiful, and he's, he's using the sweet grass and to try to bring you back, to bring you back to consciousness. Wow. And uh, you don't want to come back. Wow, so the more that the elder takes you through the uh, experience of um, the sweat lodge where you feel closer and closer to this being, to this, to this near-death experience where this arrogant creature that's trying to hold on to dear life is experiencing this, this being that is that is then flashing all of the moments, time stops, all of these moments of all of the times of, 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 of ignorant behavior towards mother or father or malevolent behavior towards others, um, the lack of realization of the interconnectedness, all of these things flash before, uh, and then this, the, the realization of the spirit and the interconnectedness with the one, all is happening there. And then, yeah. and then those, those moments are the reason why uh, you don't want to come out of the sweat lodge once it's done. And you, but there is heaven on earth happening. There's the beautiful sunrises and sunsets, the ecosystems of the creatures and the plants. The and beauty of life. Beauty of life. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but the beauty of being at peace with the Creator Yes. And at one with the Creator is more beautiful than than uh, than that as well because it is a total peace. And uh, yes. and so he the elder talks you back, and finally you say to Creator. What he's talking about is so beautiful. And the Creator says, yes, it is. Life is beautiful. Can I go back for a second and see what he's talking about? Well, you're a free spirit. You choose. I'll be back. I'll be back in, in a minute. Well, time is whatever. 
but I have to see what he's talking about. So then I come back, open my eyes, and just see it. I've never seen anything more beautiful than the, that moment. And so then he says, you're going to have to walk with me back to the, to the sweat lodge. He said, yes. And uh, uh, I said, uh, so he helps me back to the lodge. And, and I say, you know, like, what's that in the distance, all that haze and all? And why are we walking on this land that's all plowed, you know? What have they done to our mother? Mm -hmm. And he says, oh, we have done that. And why are we doing that? And why is that all that dark haze over there, that, that city over there, you're, you just, just don't understand. And then you come into the lodge with him and because only after the second round did you get your first sip of water. Yeah. So you go back in the lodge and he puts the uh, uh, water on the rocks, red hot rocks, and whoosh, super hot in there. And uh, you start coming back into your body and then and uh, he says, you say, uh, uh, I really don't want to be here. I really don't like it here. Look what they're doing. Look what they're doing to our mother, the earth. And yes. It's not a good time. Yes. He says, it's not a good time for an Indian. <laughs> so, uh, this so. is a challenging time of transition. This is a challenging yeah. time of consciousness evolution for the younger brother in the metropolis is to wake up to the elder's teachings, yeah. to the so, oneness. Uh, you know, where when I get my first sip of water, it, it's just so hard to take. It's just like my life just coming back in my body and wow. painful. And then, uh, so I'm, I'm, sort of writhing on the ground, my elder looks at me. He says, yeah, it's tough to be an Indian. <laughs> and so uh, he, uh, wow. he uh, says, but you're back now. And, and you've learned something, haven't you? Yes, I have. He says, good. Then uh, and uh, and then we. I was holding my pipe, and he says, "That pipe is a very strong symbol of your experience." I said, "Yes, the most important thing in my life." He says, "Yes, but it's a physical. It's a physical uh, thing. It's just a pipe. You're putting too much meaning in it." It says, to me, it's very precious. It reminds me of my whole experience. He says, you're too attached to it. Uh, go where you have passed it and bury it. And so I go there and bury the pipe, and I think, oh my goodness, it, I feel like I'm burying myself. And, and then I come back in the lodge, and he says, um, you see, um, you can't be so attached to the physical if you're a spiritual being. You, it's, uh, and the pipe, when you get, I'll give you an, another pipe, but so when you take that pipe and you turn it in the four directions, heaven and earth, you'll be reminded that you have a pipe where you have fasted, and it'll remind you of that. Yeah. 
and uh, so you now are a pipe carrier. So, uh, and you're reminded of your connection to the Creator and, and, and what have you learned? Well, for one thing, you can't be so judgmental and critical of yourself. You have to care for yourself yes. more. I also learned if I can't criticize myself, how can I criticize others? Yes. Right. Yes. Uh, and so all the things you've learned is very important. And that's, so now you can start this journey. So I said, I'm, uh, you know, what I've discovered is when I have these terrible stress attacks, uh, if I hear the songs, they seem to go away because the songs are very powerful. So I really have to learn those songs. He says, you cannot learn them. I says, how do I get those songs that are so powerful so I can keep myself in balance? Well, you're going to have to fast for them. Mm -hmm. Go, what? Mm -hmm. Yes. When the spirit comes to take you, you can say, oh, my creator, you can take me if you wish. I've only come here for the songs. Wow. And uh, he says, that's what you're going to have to do to get the songs. Go like, are you kidding? <laughs> but then there was a time in working in the urban center that I needed the song. So I came back to him and he says, so you come for the songs? I said, yeah, okay. It'll take you a year to prepare yourself wow. for that fast. Yeah. I says, do you know, uh, that fast is a real challenge, I said. I think I, I died out there. And I says, you know, that's what you put me on, put my life in jeopardy. He said, you made that decision yourself. And I said, what did, you've been on these fasts, what have you experienced? Exactly the same, exactly. Um, why didn't you tell me and then I wouldn't have had to go on that long fast? You could have just told me what I would experience. He says, I couldn't do that because I would have robbed you the opportunity of you discovering it yourself. By telling you that, you would not have experienced it. And now you know you've experienced it and that is real for you. That is not... Uh, you know, a myth or it doesn't come from my head as a story. You experienced it yeah. and that's real. I would have robbed you that opportunity if I would have told you. Okay. Yes, it's experiential so, wisdom gained. Yeah. So then uh, I had to, uh, then one of, so I used to always go to the Lodge to get rid of the um, my stress attacks, and so I learned the songs by going on a long fast, so I could sing the songs until I went to an elder sweat, who would then knock that shit out of me, and uh, and then so I would sing the songs in the lodge uh, for for one of the elders. Finally, the elder moved his lodge to his community, so that I didn't have a sweat lodge anymore to be able to survive the city. So uh, I went back to the elder and he says, now you want a sweat lodge for yourself? I says, I would really like that. I said, how could I do a sweat lodge for myself? 
quite simply, you have to pass for it, because I can't give it to you. Only the Spirit can give it to you. Interesting. So again, long pass to the sweat lodge. And then, and then, uh, so then I got my sweat lodge, and then, and then I, I was perfectly happy, and until someone came and says, Doug, I know you have a sweat lodge. Can I come and sweat with you? So I phoned my elder and he said, what am I going to do? Did I deny you? No. Yeah. Well, you're going to have to come here and pass with me to be able to ask the Creator if someone could come in the lodge with you. Oh, I went on. I had to go through that. I was, uh, so people would come in my sweat lodge and I could run the lodge and yeah. make sure that it would be okay for the people in the lodge. Yeah. And then somebody then asked me if I would do a doctoring lodge with an eagle swing and I said, can I do that? Yeah, you can, Raymond. I said, but you you're going to have to come in fast with me. It. Yeah. Holy shit. You know. Well, did I deny you, you know? And you have to care for people, and if they need it, yeah. you should be available for them. I was available for you. Yes, yes, yes. And yes, yes, yes. So then I had a fast with him, and that was a very hard fast with the Eagle Sweep. This reoccurring So that's, that's the journey you, you Come yes. Or on. This reoccurring theme of indigenous wisdom around the world of figuring out the different rituals, ceremonies, strategies in recommuning with the one and feeling that true yoga as an experiential wisdom, this union with the one for all the different methodologies that exist. This seems to be by far the most first principled thing that every child needs to experience as they come into this world and that we ourselves in our metropolises need to look at what the elders and what this indigenous wisdom is and embody it and realize it to ensure a prosperous future. Douglas, this has been such a fascinating conversation with you. I am so grateful and so honored that we were able to pass this. Well, thank you. Thank and you. when I'm working with a priest like Father Merckx, when I did the church with him and then after, and I, he'd say, um, I'm sorry that you went through, you know, that uh, convent experience because we used to have that connection in the church. We would uh, go out and fast, and do these ceremonies. And uh, so I understand that. And um, his thing is, uh, I believe that your path is a very important path. And I respect that. And we became good friends. And so, uh, because I believe it's universal, but that many cultures have that experience. And many rituals, I've experienced that. And, uh, The old cultures, the hunter-gatherer cultures, the old cultures, uh, they had the same experience, the same connection with the Creator. Yes. And I find that with the indigenous people in China. Yes. I've been asked to go uh, and work with some of the indigenous people there. And they have these, there are different ceremonies, but they're like the same. 
So when they come to Ottawa, they ask me, can, you, can we have a sweat lodge together? And I know I had, uh, the Moso people are very matriarchal, the only, probably, strongest matriarchal community in China. And they still have their language, their culture, their ceremonies and everything. So the Moso princess, she says to me, uh, she came to Ottawa, can we have a sweat together? I said, sure. So she went through the sweat with me. And she says, when I went through the sweat, my third eye opened to my ancestors, she said. She says, we had a similar ceremony, but we lost it 200 years ago. Do you think your elders can come and talk to my elders and maybe we can get it back? So there's uh, that kind of connection that is universal, I feel, to people. And I know there was a shaman uh, who actually was uh, shaman from China, very powerful man who was a scholar and who was actually a member of the, of the government because the um, Chinese government, uh, although all the ministers are Hans, a lot of the top people in government are scholars and so he was a top member of the government, he was a scholar, but he was also a shaman. Yeah. And because uh, they only hire uh, scholars because they feel that they need that input, which I found really interesting. So he wanted to meet me at the museum. And I, so uh, I went, met him at the museum and we were having lunch together. He says, I understand this building. I walked through this building and I understand it. And he laughs and he touches my hand. He says, only another shaman can understand this building. He says, yeah. Yes. It's a universal language. Yes. And so uh, it's, it's really interesting, you know, how no matter where you go, um, and indigenous people uh, everywhere uh, have that connection. Yes. My wife is Basque. Yes. She's an indigenous person. Yeah. We have that same connection. Yeah. And her uncle is a priest. And uh, uh, her mother, a uh, matriarch of her, of her family. Um, for fun, we decided to get married in, in, uh, in Las Vegas. Her mother calls us up. That's not a marriage. You come, come home now. Yeah. <laughs> we have to do it right. And so, she decided that we'd get married in the center at Leola, the center of the Jesuits, by her brother, who was a priest. Yeah. So. Uh, it's a shared principle of indigenous wisdom around our world is yeah. to recommune with the one and this is the most important thing for us to bring into our modernity and uh, incorporate embody the true wisdom of it Douglas again thank you for coming on the program this is well such an honor thank you thank you yeah and I thank the elders for all their teachings likewise Yes, yes. Younger brother, wake up to these teachings. Thank you everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking about all the things that Douglas has been teaching us. We'd love to hear from you. Check out the links in the bio below to more of Douglas's work. 
Also check out the links in the bio below to the American Anthropological Association. Check them out and support them. And you can support our show as well. You can find all of our show links below and support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the spiritual leaders, the organizations around the world that you believe in and go and build the future. Recommune with the one. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in, everyone. Yeah, we're all brothers and sisters. Yes, we are. Yeah. We'll see you soon. That's a wrap. Mm. Is that okay? It was incredible. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, my brother. Thank you. Yeah. I'm so blessed. Thank you. Thank you.